Hello, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Memo's Weekly Review with me, Nassim Ahmed, and my guest, Moin Robbani. Hi, Moin. Thank you for joining us again. Thank you for having me, uh, Nassim. It's good to be with you again. So a lot's happened this week, uh, and we'll try and cover as much as we can um, with the Security Council resolution for a ceasefire. Uh, there was a Al Jazeera documentary on 7 October, and uh, so I want to ask Moen about his key takeaways from that documentary. Uh, we'll also cover the, um, the preeminent global institution monitoring famine, which has warned that uh, starvation in Gaza uh, is uh, imminent. And how significant is that? Um, with Canada halting arms sale, Blinken warning of Israel's isolation in the world. So we will be asking if there has been a recalibration of um, Western position with regards to Israel. And after months of um, ceasefire resolution failing at the UN, partly because of US vetoing, after 170 days yesterday and the death of 32,000 Palestinians, finally the Security Council voted on a ceasefire. So I'll get Moin's thoughts on that. And also, I'll be um, we'll be looking into a new U.S. bill that's been passed, uh, threatening to defund the Palestinian Authority if it actively supports uh, prosecution of Israelis in the International Criminal Court. And uh, we'll end with a discussion about the recent terror attack in Moscow and the and basically the the, the, the dangers and. Uh, of connecting ISIS with Hamas? What, what are the um, errors and the dangers of doing that? So let's begin with um, the Al Jazeera documentary, Moin. Uh, it's been a while. I think many people have been anticipating a documentary by Al Jazeera. Uh, what was your key takeaway from the hour-long documentary? Well, I think it's probably the most accurate picture that has thus far been made available about what did and what didn't happen um, on October 7th, uh, based on interviews with a um, wide array of people from uh, the different parties and different perspectives um, and so on. My, my key takeaways are, um, first of all, that as we suspected, um, the Israeli military um, and intelligence services did collapse like a house of cards on October 7th. There were several senior Israeli officials who suggested um, that Israel did in fact have sufficient evidence um, to prevent uh, the attacks on October 7th, but for a variety of reasons having to do with um, Israeli hubris and policy and assumptions, uh, failed to prevent them. That part I didn't find um, entirely convincing. Um, my view remains that um, uh, apart from some uh, minor um, uh, signals from junior people in the food chain immediately before the attacks, um, Israel simply had no intelligence and no clue about um, uh, what was coming. Second of all, I think the documentary made very clear what Hamas's purpose was, which was primarily to overrun um, the Gaza division, um, that division of the Israeli military, which is primarily responsible um, for maintaining uh, the blockade uh, of, of the Gaza Strip and keeping Palestinians in Gaza in their place. Um, third of all, I think it also makes clear for those who would still have doubts that there were indeed atrocities um, uh, perpetrated by Palestinians on October 7th um, against uh, civilians, and it gave even um, visual evidence for this. And in addition to that, I think there were um, two important points that in at least uh, some cases, Israeli civilians um, were killed uh, inadvertently or deliberately by Israeli forces, either in crossfire where they were seeking to regain control of, of territory that had been seized by uh, Hamas or an implementation of the Hannibal Directive, which is a Israeli principle that um, a dead Israeli is better than an Israeli captive in Palestinian hands. And um, uh, the other, I think a lot of people will 
also uh, be paying attention to this, is that um, um, the most lurid Israeli atrocity stories um, are essentially war propaganda concocted out of thin air and fabricated uh, for deliberately political um, uh, purposes in order to expand um, the uncritical Western support for the genocidal assault uh, on the Gaza Strip that came after. So on the whole, I found it to be a very um, thorough, uh, well-researched, um, uh, well-presented, um, comprehensive, and on the whole, accurate uh, presentation of what did, and as importantly, what did not transpire on the 7th of October, 2023. What was um, interesting for me is how they ignored the, you know, human rights, uh, the attack on civilians and the human rights abuse that did take place and ignoring that completely for the fabrication of the 40 beheaded babies and allegations of rape being weaponized. So I think that was important for me, partly because as one of the as one of the experts who was interviewed said, um, the reason why Israel did that uh, was because the kind of operation it was going to mount this genocidal war, it needed to, in the eyes of the world, make sure, prove that Israel is justified in going after Hamas in the way it did to justify its genocide. And that came out clear. But I think what has undermined Israel's position is now that all this evidence has come out, no one can take Israel's word again. No one can believe Israel when it says that it's attacking Shifa because of Hamas is hiding behind the hospital or taking civilians as human shield. So we can never believe Israel anymore, given the level of the lie that was perpetrated from the top of Israeli governance and also US administration to justify the genocide. And that, I think, for a lot of people is what um, is very concerning and uh you know because of the manner in which it was uh done yes well uh, and, sorry please go ahead yeah that's what the, i think that stood out for me and that was that they came out really clearly and it's important especially when you're going to war not to lie in such a brazen manner uh to lie and justify uh in support of a genocide uh, and that i think was quite shocking al jazeera um clearly uh, the documentary laid that out. Israel could have, if it wanted to, just show the um, the real life footage and the human rights abuse and the attack that took place, but instead it opted to mount this propaganda. And, and that, I think, is what has caused Israel to lose all credibility when it comes to uh, its claims, its numbers in this uh, in this um, you know uh, bombardment of Gaza. Yes, I, I think you're entirely right. Or perhaps I should add. Theoretically, you're entirely right, because Israeli mendacity and, 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 and fabrication and war propaganda has reached such a level that no one really takes them seriously anymore, except some of the most influential media in the world. Um, American Pravda, The New York Times, um, every time Israel makes a claim, for example, about mass rapes and command centers under El Shifa Hospital and all the rest of it, they run detailed investigative reports that purport to demonstrate the veracity of Israeli claims. And then after the damage is done, um, and it's um, uh, too late to have any influence um, on uh, on decision making, then they um, slowly and gradually begin to backtrack as they're doing now um, about their major quote unquote investigative piece about systematic organized rape. Um, uh, um, what was it? Screams uh, Without Words, which has been, I think, aptly renamed um, Screams Without Evidence. The other thing that strikes me exactly as you say is, is that, um, you know, um, every party in conflict engages in war propaganda. And the purpose of war propaganda is usually either um, to confuse rather than convince, or to convince using, um, basing a, a, a narrative around at least a kernel of truth. What we've seen now with Israel, it's just completely over the top. So for example, you know, um, there's imminent famine in the Gaza Strip. So instead of, for example, saying that Israel is seeking to work with 
humanitarian agencies to ensure that food gets in or whatever. They say, no, actually, we, Israel, are delivering food to the Palestinians, and we're doing it in greater amounts than we're entering before October 7th. So the disconnect um, between myth and fact is just so massive and huge um, that it really um, needs a very substantial ideological investment in Israel and its genocide to even begin um, to, to take their propaganda seriously. And on that, I mean, you're absolutely right there. Um, everyone seems, everyone knows there's a gen uh, sorry, famine in, happening right now. Uh, British Foreign Secretary David Cameron accused Israel of hindering the flow of AIDS into Gaza. Um, and this week, also the IPC, the, the Famine Review Committee, the integrated, you know, they have an integrated phrase classification on which category of famine Palest uh, a, a group is in. Palestinians are in the stage, the high stage of an imminent famine. And that's the um, conclusion of the IPC. Uh, and this dispute, uh, it, it has turned quite bizarre with uh, the Israeli foreign, uh, sorry, the government spokesperson, Elon Levy, uh, he was apparently former. suspended. Former, yeah. So he was suspended because he challenged uh, the British Foreign Secretary over his accusation that Israel is hindering the flow of aid. So, which goes to show that if the US wanted to, or the UK wanted to exert power over the Israelis, it can do that. It, it, this is an example of that. But that aside, um, I mean, how significant is the IPC's intervention in this? This is a preeminent, preeminent organization monitoring famine across the world. Now it's come out and said that Palestinians in Gaza are facing an imminent famine. And Israel, of course, as you mentioned, it's it's compl in complete denial about uh, the reality on the ground. Yeah, well, it depends. I mean, if, if, if you're a rational human being who forms opinions and conclusions on the basis of, of evidence and um, uh, on the basis of, of facts and analysis and conclusion presented by leading specialists in a field, then it's very, um, uh, it's very significant. And I would argue uh, very convincing because this isn't, um, uh, you know, um, uh, the president of Egypt or some uh, minor bureaucrat in the European Union. No, as you said, this is an IPC, the world's leading authority on such matters is presenting voluminous evidence um, uh, to present its case in a very convincing manner. But if you're Israel or one of its flunkies, um, then you begin to ask questions like, well, if there was a Holocaust, where is the memo written by Hitler calling on the SS to exterminate all the Jews? You know, it's that, that kind of level of, um, of, of, of denialism. And you begin to accuse um, uh, these professionals of being motivated by anti-Semitism, being Hamas operatives, and and all these other crazy uh, uh, crazy responses. As you said, Levy um, has been sent out uh, to pasture, but he's still as active as ever. And you know, among his flunkies and 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 people who have taken a decision to be blind to the reality, because the only truth they will accept. Um, is that which emanates directly from those responsible for this genocidal assault and, and, and incipient famine or endorsed by them, you know, he's still speaking the gospel truth. Yeah, um, I want to now turn our attention to a number of big shifts in on the global arena with regards to Israel and um, Palestine. Um, we'll get to the UN resolution later on, but let's begin with um, some of the shifts within Israel's traditional allies. Uh, Canada, for example, uh, took the unimaginable, unimaginable step last week of halting arms exports to Israel, joining Holland, Japan, Spain and Belgium. Um, UK Labour Party leader Keir Starmer, he came out and said that there should be an imminent ceasefire. And when he was asked, why didn't you ask for that before, knowing that this is what's going to happen, his justification was simply, oh, facts on the grounds have changed and therefore I've changed my position on this. That was basically his argument. And, and I wanted to read a quote from an article in The Economist. Economist, as everyone knows, is a very pro-Israeli out 
um, publication, uh, uh, but it had a front cover of its Sorry, it magazine. wasn't always so, I should add. Okay, okay, it wasn't always so. So in, in this week, it has a front cover with Israel alone, and it says that, and I quote, um, that ceasefire talks will fail, that could leave Israel locked in the bleakest trajectory of its 75-year existence, featuring endless occupation, hard right politics and isolation. Today, many Israelis are in denial about this, about a political reckoning that will come eventually. It will determine not only the fate of Palestinians, but also whether Israel thrives in the next 75 years, end quote. So I think on, on the global stage, there's been a lot of shifts and also in the uh, views and attitudes of the, um, I would say, a lot of the uh, media, the economics in, economists in this case. So do you think there's, there is a recalibration that's now taking place amongst key traditional allies of Israel and also traditionally pro-Israeli outlets like The Economist? Well, I think it's it's interesting, particularly your um, uh, observations regarding um, shifts in state policy, uh, because let's not forget um, uh, these governments are motivated neither by any form of of, of sympathy or solidarity uh, with the Palestinian people, who they tend to view as irrelevant and expendable um, human scum, um, uh, nor are they necessarily, um, nor are they for that matter, motivated by any kind of hostility to Israel or opposition to its policies. What we're seeing, I think, is a gradual shift, gradual but nevertheless more rapid than I had anticipated, where you have these governments who um, uh, tend to be, first of all, terrified um, of the United States, and second of all, terrified, traditionally um, terrified of the Israel lobby and Israel supporters um, in their respective countries, who in the past have always um, pledged uh, loyalty um, or at least acquiescence to Israel's most extreme policies because it was in their partisan political interests um, uh, to do so, was, let's call it, the path of least resistance who now really for the first time um, in 75 years are beginning to shift uh, their attitudes and their policies, however, gradually, I think primarily out of self-interest and on the basis of electoral considerations. So you take someone like um, Keir Starmer, you know, with his whole um, concocted um, uh, campaign against um, uh, systematic anti-Semitism in his own party, as, as, as he called it. And this is someone who basically saw that hitching his cart to Netanyahu, Ben Gvir, and Smotrich was essential um, uh, to gaining power in the United Kingdom in the next election, and is now shifting his position because he's concerned that unless he distances himself uh, from Israel, he may not have as easy of a path to 10, down, to 10 Downing Street as he anticipated. And you're seeing this in other countries. Holland, I think, um, uh, is a bit of an anomaly here. In Holland, you have the outgoing prime minister, uh, Mark Rutte, who wants to become uh, the next secretary general of NATO and already has US and UK support for that. Um, who, as part of his campaign, has suppressed um, legal opinions from the foreign ministry, who has ensured there is absolutely no daylight uh, between um, Dutch and U.S. policy towards a genocide uh, in Gaza, but whose government was nevertheless um, ordered by uh, the Dutch courts to cease supplying um, spare parts for F-35 uh, jet fighters to Israel because of the human rights implications. And although the Dutch government has said it respects um, uh, this um, uh, legal ruling, there are continuing suspicious suspicions yet to be confirmed, but serious suspicions nonetheless, um, that the Netherlands is continuing to supply uh, these um, uh, spare parts to Israel, but indirectly, 
rather than directly. That's that's just a detail. But I think the broader picture here is that we appear to be entering an era in the politics of Western states, which have been, of course, Israel's sponsors um, uh, since the last century, an era in which blind support for Israel is becoming um, an electoral and political burden rather than an asset. And that, I think, is an extraordinarily important uh, transformation. It's, it's a slow and gradual one, but one to keep an eye on nonetheless. Yeah, I think Canada and Holland withholding arms shipments to Israel doesn't really make much of a difference on the ground because the overwhelming majority, I think some 95% or more of the arms and the munitions delivered is from the US and uh, Germany. So it doesn't really make much of a difference on the ground. And the US position on this has been really bizarre. And and, and I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Um, on the one hand, you had Blinken uh, last week warning Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and his war cabinet in a meeting on Friday that Israel's security and its place in the world are in peril. And you might not realize it until it's too late. And, and, I, and that's his direct quote. And he went on to say that uh, you, Israel, need a coherent plan or either you're going to be stuck in Gaza. Uh, but Netanyahu went on to say, if we need to, we'll go it alone. Of course, Israel will never go it alone, knowing that America will always be on its side. But I thought that was quite an interesting exchange, uh, especially given what is the US said later on with regards to the Security Council resolution uh, ceasefire vote, and also another dis uh, topic which we will discuss, discuss which is um, Biden as office concluding that Israel is not committing war crimes, uh, human rights abuse. So we'll get to that. But I want to get, just get your thoughts on that exchange between Netanyahu and Blinken, uh, that Blinken himself is warning that Israel is becoming a pariah and it's going to be too late for you unless you find a coherent plan in Gaza. Well, this, this according to um, reports I've seen, this, this appears to be also related to differences um, within the U.S. leadership. I think first um, we need to clarify that all these positions emanating from Washington have one and only one purpose, which is um, what's um, uh, determining what's best for the United States and determining what's best for Israel. And more often than not, um, there's a failure to make any distinction between what is best for the United States and what is best for Israel. These are seen almost as, as co-terminus. The Palestinians, of course, um, don't figure into this equation at all, as I mentioned previously, particularly in, 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 in this administration. But in U.S. Um, politics generally, they're seen as irrelevant and expendable human scum. Now, what appears to have happened is, is that um, Biden, is, as we know, is very personally invested in Israel. He proclaim, proudly proclaims himself to be a Zionist. Um, he and came of age, came of political age, when Israel was viewed in the US um, as one of um, Washington's major Cold War assets globally, um, and particularly in, in, in the Middle East. And he has this, I think, visceral, emotional, political, ideological, passionate attachment uh, to Israel that we've really never um, seen from um, uh, any previous US uh, president. Uh, Blinken, while largely sharing um, uh, the same outlook, has been to the Middle East on, on multiple occasions since October 7th, and is probably seeing um, uh, U.S. influence in the region drain away before his very eyes. And this appears to have come to a head with regard to the U.S. position on um, an Israeli ground, in, ground operation in uh, Rafah. And um, what is being suggested is that Biden has basically signed off on it, provided Israel uh, meets um, uh, certain conditions, but Blinken has come to the conclusion that any Israeli ground operation in Rafah would be a disaster, um, not only for Israel in the terms that you've uh, ex that he's expressed that you just recounted, 
um, but would also do additional significant damage um, to, to the U.S. Uh, position and influence in the region and even um, globally. And I think that's the background against which we need to uh, assess these statements. Yeah, and another bit of context is um, are the response uh, to the UN Security Council resolution. And I want to speak about that. So that's the big news from yesterday. Uh, the Security Council passed a resolution calling for a ceasefire uh, for Ramadan. And um, the US abstained. And uh, it, and since it's done everything it can to downplay the resolution saying that it's non-binding, Israel can carry on doing what it's doing. That's the message from the White House. And at the same time, um, there's a the US has determined that Israel is in compliance with President Joe Biden's national security memoranda. Basically, um, that Israel is supposed to comply with um, international law and US law before it could be uh, given weapons and Israel apparently has given reassurances, assurances that it is abiding by U.S. laws, international law, and the White House has basically accepted that. And Biden is convinced that Israel is not uh, breaking any U.S. laws. And I find that quite bizarre, especially in the in a week where we've mentioned uh, the famine, we've mentioned the U.N. resolution, and within that context, you have. Uh, the White House downplaying the resolution at the same time, saying that it is um, it has um, it has uh, been given reassurances by Israel that Israel is not violating any U.S. law. So I found that very very puzzling. Yeah, I mean, I th I think this is an interesting um, uh, Security Council resolution. I would say it's it's significant and important um, in in particular respects, and also, of course. Um, will change nothing on the ground, not least because of, of the points you just raised. Um, the US, as, as you know, has uh, vetoed three Security Council resolutions um, uh, calling for a ceasefire in um, uh, Gaza. Uh, it has voted against several resolutions in the General Assembly uh, calling for the same. What happened this time is that this was not a resolution proposed by Algeria um, on behalf of uh, the Arab group. Uh, this was not a resolution um, that was submitted by Russia and or China. This was a resolution that was drafted by the elected 10 uh, members of the Security Council uh, resolution. So in other words, um, uh, states from every region in the world uh, states with very different um, governments and attitudes towards this conflict, who collectively came to the conclusion that this situation is, um, cannot be allowed to continue. And the elected 10, I should point out, includes um, on this occasion very close U.S. allies like Japan, like South Korea, like uh, Ecuador also, uh, I believe. Um, and on that basis, it became clear that um, it was going to be another uh, 14 to one vote with the US uh, vetoing. Now, what happened are several things. Um, first of all, the US uh, succeeded in, af after, after the draft had been finalized, the US went back for one more negotiation to have the term permanent uh, ceasefire replaced by, I think it was a, uh, lasting and sustainable uh, ceasefire. So in other words, to water it down. Um, and of course, the um, uh, the resolution calls for a ceasefire during the month of Ramadan, which ends, I think, around the 10th of April, uh, leading to a lasting and um, sustainable ceasefire. So in other words, the United States government managed to um, uh, procrastinate and, 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 and play the long game until halfway through the month of Ramadan um, before acceding uh, to a ceasefire resolution for that particular month. Uh, the U.S. got its way on, on, on that point. The resolution was passed, 14 votes in favor, 
uh, the U.S. abstained because, of course, it still can't bring itself um, to vote for anything that concerns um, preservation of Palestinian lives or, or, or rights. And then the damage control immediately began. First, the United States claimed that because um, this resolution was not passed under Chapter 7, that it is non-binding. And basically, um, uh, Israel is free to ignore this uh, resolution if it so chooses. Well, um, if you look at the UN Charter, every UN Security Council resolution is by definition um, binding, binding not only on the members of the Security Council, but binding on each and every member state of the United Nations. Secondly, um, there's a ruling from the International Court of Justice, um, which is um, uh, the highest authority and ultimate arbiter of any um, procedures or rules related to the United Nations, um, a ruling from 1970, which states explicitly that there is no hierarchy among UN Security Council resolutions, and they are all equally binding. Um, and so, you know, the United States and the United Kingdom um, have tried to, in the past, to promote this view that, that some resolutions are more equal than others, that some are more binding than others. But the other interesting thing here is that those who drafted this resolution used the exact same wording of a previous Security Council resolution regarding um, the urgency of a ceasefire in Syria several years ago, which the US not only voted for, but insisted was binding upon the government of Syria. But now all of a sudden it's um, uh, do as you please. So first there was that. Secondly, as you noted, um, uh, the White House trotted out its uh, thoroughly discredited uh, spokesperson, and I believe the State Department did the same. Um, who made explicitly clear our policy is unchanged. This does not require Israel um, to uh, to change its policy. Um, basically, things can continue as they are. Unless there be any doubt about U.S. Um, uh, policy and intentions, on that very same day, um, the White House came out with a determination, as you mentioned, um, that Israel is using its weapon is using the weapons supplied to it by um, the United States in accordance, not just with international law, but in accordance with US domestic regulations, which if they were applied correctly, would um, prohibit the supply of weapons um, to um, uh, uh, states that engage in, in, in deliberate mass killings of, um, uh, of civilians, or when those um, or weapons can also not be applied to a state that is preventing um, the provision of U.S. humanitarian um, uh, assistance. So basically, the U.S. is saying, we've looked at how Israel is conducting this war, um, and um, uh, we're perfectly comfortable with the way our weapons are being used in the Gaza Strip. We're fine with it nothing to see here. Okay, there's a few tens of thousands dead and a genocide case in the International Court of Justice, but let's move on and continue. Yeah, Bernie Sanders came out strongly against that and he said the State Department's position on this, um, that Israel is using U.S. weapons according to U.S. domestic law, makes a mockery of U.S. law. That, that, that's basically what he said. Returning to the UN Security Council resolution, I wanted to get your thoughts on... Um, on another aspect of that, Hamas came out strongly in support of the resolution and Israel has condemned it. Israel has um, criticised the US for abstaining. I found that quite strange, partly because the US itself is saying this resolution is meaningless on the ground. It has no real impact on the ground. Um, so why has Israel come out condemning its key ally in the way it has, uh, given that in their view, this resolution is meaningless. Yes, well, um, just one more point on, on that uh, uh, resolution and, and the US response. Um, a key issue um, for those who drafted this resolution was that its demand, it, 
that was that a ceasefire should be a demand rather than an aspiration uh, using convoluted meaningless language as was a case with the um, uh, resolution drafted by the US last week that was vetoed by Russia and China. So it explicitly demands an immediate ceasefire. And secondly, it also demands the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. But crucially, these two demands um, are independent of each other. In other words, um, one is not a precondition um, for, for the other. And that was a main point of contention for the US. It wanted to connect them together. It lost, but nevertheless, as soon as the resolution passed, it gave its own interpretation and said, actually, um, they, are, they are connected. Regarding the... Um, the um, Israeli uh, response, I my own view is is that it's the ha hallmark of an irrational state, um, uh, which has gone off the reservation, when it can no longer distinguish between its closest and most important allies, on whom it is utterly dependent, on the one hand, and its fiercest adversaries and enemies on the other. And if you look at the way that Israel responded to the U.S. abstention, um, uh, you know, it's a kind of language that most states, uh, Western states, for example, might use against um, Russia, perhaps not even uh, China, but basically um, um, characterizing the United States as an enemy of Israel, um, as an ally of Israel's uh, enemies. I mean, it's 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 just you know, I it's impossible to to wrap your head around this unless you accept um, that this has become a thoroughly irrational state on the one hand, and secondly, that um, Netanyahu considers that this will help him in domestic political terms. So imagine here you have an Israeli leader who thinks that picking a fight with the state on whom his own is utterly dependent, um, not only for its ability very existence, has come to the conclusion that it's in his political interest to pick a fight with um, uh, not only the United States, but with the self-proclaimed Zionist Joe Biden of all people, um, he thinks it's in his political interest, and he may well be right, because Israeli society itself is also becoming increasingly loopy. Mm. I, I mentioned Hamas and the support of the Security Council resolution. Uh, Hamas has previously also advocated for the International Criminal Court to investigate war crimes, crimes against humanity, and in the occupied West Bank and the Gaza Strip. I mentioned this in light of a um, a report that's basically gone under the radar. Uh, the US passed a bill uh, threatening to cut off funding from the Palestinian Authority if a, the Palestinians seek to obtain UN membership or actively support an ICC investigation into allegations of war crimes, crimes against humanity, against Israeli nationals. I, I, I found that um, quite bizarre, uh, trying to close all avenues for the Palestinian Authority, you know, not Hamas, Palestinian Authority, from seeking any um, um, redemptive measures. But what, what, what the question, I guess, is do you think the PA will even, even pay attention to this threat? In this new bill, that if it goes to the ICC, they will cut funding, uh, and um, I think you know, is there a possibility if the US was to cut funding, the other uh, countries around the world will seek to fund the PA? Um, how do you think this will play out uh, in the coming months if the PA seeks to go to the ICC? Well, there's an old saying um, that the United States um, is often more pro-Israel than Israel itself. And this, I think, is a, is a perfect um, example of that. I should add, um, these aren't new um, issues. Um, already around um, 10, 15 years ago, when um, uh, the PLO first went to the United Nations seeking recognition of 
Palestinian statehood, um, the U.S. Uh, Congress adopted a law that requires the United States um, to withdraw from and terminate funding to any UN agency that accepts the state of Palestine as a member. And there were several instances in which this in fact happened. In my view, the Palestinian leadership made the terrible mistake of not seeking to join those UN agencies that genuinely matter to the United, uh, United States, such as, I can't remember its name, but um, the International Agency for Patents and Copyright. I think the first priority for the Palestinians should have been to join that agency and call the American bluff um, and have them withdraw from an agency whose mandate is very near and dear um, uh, to not only the United States government, but also the plutocrats that run that country. Um, in terms of, of um, uh, what your, uh, in terms of the, your question, um, yes, it's now also the ICC. Now the question here is that the Palestinian Authority, State of Palestine, is already it has already been involved for almost a decade in seeking to persuade the International Criminal Court in The Hague, and particularly its 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 current invisible prosecutor, Karim Khan, to fulfill fulfill their mandate and um, uh, their responsibility. So, if the U.S. Um, uh, wants to implement this law, it should immediately terminate all funding to the Palestinian Authority. Um, if it doesn't do so, then um, its uh, threats uh, are meaningless. But if it does so, it should also prepare for the consequences, which are likely going to be um, a collapse um, uh, of, of the Palestinian Authority, because although the U.S. does not directly fund the Palestinian Authority, again, because of uh, previous laws and so on, there is a lot of uh, covert and, and indirect uh, support, particularly to the Palestinian security forces, its, its intelligence agencies, and so on. And um, the motivation for this U.S. support is not Palestinian rights or preparing Palestinians for statehood or Palestinian democracy or any of that nonsense. U.S. support to the Palestinians has one motivation and one objective alone, which is um, uh, making the occupied territories safe for permanent Israeli occupation and settlement expansion and ultimately annexation. That is really ultimately the only reason that there is any U.S. Um, assistance uh, to the Palestinian Authority. So from my point of view, I think the U.S. making good on its word and severing all um, assistance to um, the Palestinian um, uh, security forces would be a most welcome thing. And to add to that, I mean, it's just further evidence that all avenues for Palestinians to resist their occupiers has been blocked. Uh, well, whether it be armed resistance, whether it be legal measures, whether it be going to the ICC, ICJ, every avenue they pursue, there's always a penalty that's attached to them pursuing yeah. any form of resistance. Precisely. I mean, Palestinians have no right to oppose <laughs> Israeli uh, policy. The way they usually say these things is, well, um, we oppose terrorism. Where is the Palestinian Gandhi? Where is the Palestinian this? Where is the Palestinian that? But then whenever they're presented with popular or nonviolent um, uh, forms of resistance to Israel, whether, as you said, it's going to the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, efforts to boycott uh, Israel, um, that all is punished as well. So again, I think it's important to recognize the Western um, problem with Palestinian opposition uh, to Israel, it's not, it has nothing to do with armed resistance. They oppose any Palestinian opposition to Israeli um, uh, destruction of Palestinian society as a matter of principle. It can be violent, it can be nonviolent. You know, if, if Palestinians, uh, there is nothing Palestinians can ever do to resist Israeli occupation that will be supported by Israel's Western sponsors. There never has been, there isn't, 
there never will be. And I think we should um, uh, get over this illusion that um, the West's real problem is with, you know, Palestinians uh, targeting uh, civilians or Palestinians taking up arms or suicide bombings. Yes, they do oppose those things. But ultimately, the reason they oppose those things is not because they're violations of the laws of war and all the rest of it. Um, they, they oppose any Palestinian opposition, full stop. Yeah, you mentioned Gandhi, and I find a lot of people who ask that question, I find it very puzzling, partly because they're, they're, I've lost count of the number of Palestinians that have been on hunger strikes, and on hunger strike for periods much longer than Gandhi ever did. Uh, and the overwhelming majority of Palestinian resistance is peaceful, whether it be hunger strikes or the BDS. But instead of accepting them as peaceful resistance, what you see, especially with the BDS in the US in particular, is it to denounce to, the terrorism and anti Semitism. Anti Semitism. Change the laws of the country to denounce it as huh. anti Semitic. Huh. And, um, and uh, that's, yeah. That, I mean, and, and sorry to interrupt you, but in Texas, it's entirely legal to get up in public and call for the um, destruction of the United States. But it's yeah. illegal to call for the destruction of Israel. Imagine, this country has gone so bonkers, you know, that, 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 it, that it protects the interests of a foreign state more than it protects its own existence. Yes, and public contracts in Texas and other states, there's, there's what you call an Israeli loyalty pledge, unless you yes. pledge loyalty that you will not boycott Israel you will not get those contracts you don't have to pledge loyalty to the United States mm. you can you, you're perfectly free to work for um uh the state governments without giving any opinion about the United States but god forbid you don't pledge loyalty to Israel you're screwed yeah I, I think we'll have a longer conversation about that I want to end with uh the, the horrific attacks in um, Moscow concert hall, which at least 137 people have been killed. And that, for me, raised a number of questions, putting aside the, you know, horrible situation. Um, the claim by the Israeli that Hamas is ISIS, ISIS is Hamas. I mean, Hamas enjoys really good relations with Russia. Uh, Moscow, in fact, does not consider Hamas a terror organization, terror group, nor does uh, China. And it sees it as a liberation movement. And Hamas, let's not also forget, it fought against ISIS and stamped out the group from Gaza. Uh, so the question is, how much of a mistake is it you know, to lump Hamas and ISIS as Netanyahu, as some of the right-wing media have been trying to do? How much of a mistake and an error is this to lump the two groups together? Well, it depends what you mean by mistake. Um, I mean, from a propaganda uh, perspective, um, Netanyahu, Biden, and, and that whole crew have not just equated Hamas with ISIS. They've indicated that in their perspective, Hamas is much worse than ISIS. Um, similarly, you know, you have um, uh, dedicated Zionists who not only equate Palestinians with the Nazis, but say that the Palestinians are in fact much worse um, uh, uh, than the Nazis. So from that perspective, um, these are things that, that used to resonate quite well with uh, Western publics. They have very little purchase in, in, in the international community as such, but in the West, they've been effective. And, and with ISIS, I think initially, it was quite effective because not only um, do most people in the West know what ISIS is, but when you um, couple these um, equivalencies and denunciations with um, concocted fabrications about um, babies being beheaded and roasted in ovens and hung from clotheslines and pregnant women being um, disemboweled and necrophilia and all this uh, other stuff, I think um, uh, it, it convinced um, uh, quite a lot of people. But if you want to analyze it um, uh, rationally, yeah, um, Hamas and ISIS are you know, okay, they're both um, they're both Islamist organizations, but to draw any equivalency between them would be like saying that, well, the Vatican and the Lord's Resistance Army are both Christian, therefore the Vatican is a Lord's Resistance Army. It's it's just completely insane um, uh, stuff, which shows you the level to which Israel and its flunkies.
um, feel they need to go to maintain um, the initiative and, and, and trying to influence uh, Western public opinion. Um, Hamas is part of a regional organization, um, which is several decades older than Israel itself, I might add, uh, the Muslim uh, Brotherhood, which is a um, uh, mass uh, movement um, uh, that seeks to uh, Islamize society and seize political power and, and achieve political power through a variety of means, including, as in the case of Hamas, free and fair democratic elections um, elsewhere through, as in Egypt, um, also through elections and previously uprisings and so on. ISIS is a very different kettle of fish, uh, of course. Um, ISIS is a uh, jihadi takfiri organization. It's kind of the um, uh, Islamist equivalent of, of Bush's famous statement, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. And then ISIS, you know, you're either uh, with ISIS or you're an infidel, particularly if you're also uh, a Muslim. Um, and ISIS, of course, um, has, has pronounced Hamas as an organization and each of its individual members uh, to be apostates and legitimate targets for violence and killings for a number of sins. Chief among them is uh, Hamas's participation in um, democratic elections, um, uh, Hamas's uh, promotion of a nationalist rather than exclusively Islamist agenda, Hamas's failure, refusal, whatever you want to call it, to impose uh, Sharia, ah, um, uh, Islamic law, as a sole source of law and legislation in the Gaza Strip after it seized power there, and a whole host of other uh, mortal sins. So um, it's it's pure propaganda. Um, uh, it's it's intended as such. Um, it's you know those making those making these claims uh, know that they um, uh, hold no water. But you know, like comparing the PLO to the Nazis uh, back in the day, uh, those promoting these uh, narratives apparently um, have come to the conclusion that, that they work quite well in seeking to influence Western public opinion. And, and in fairness, I think initially, um, you know, with Biden and Netanyahu and, and, and their friends, Ben Gvir and Smotrich uh, and Frau Genocide, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, and, and others saying, you know, Hamas is ISIS, Hamas is worse than ISIS. I think it worked for a couple of weeks. But once the 10,000th uh, Palestinian uh, child was blown to smithereens in the Gaza Strip, I think it's become somewhat uh, less effective. Um, and I think not only the international community, but increasingly public opinion in the West is also beginning to realize, well, um, there are barbarians, there are savages at work here, um, and they fly advanced Western uh, aircraft. Um, uh, they, they use um, uh, Western artillery shells uh, and so on. Yes, I think one of the most grotesque pieces of propaganda, again, is to cultivate and prime the climate in the West for, for the genocide, was right at yeah. the beginning, a number of articles that were published to say Hamas is worse than... Um, uh, the Nazis worse than Hitler. Uh, many Jews took, um, you know, um, was really offended by that and yeah. said, how, well, can you, how can you compare the two? <laughs> how can you compare the two? But there was a real drive. If, if I may just UK, interrupt. So. I, I think we have to understand um, that, that one of the tenets of, of Zionism and of Israeli policy is that anything and everything will always be subordinated to the promotion of the establishment and maintenance of a Jewish state in Palestine. And we saw this during the 1940s with the Holocaust, um, where um, uh, the agenda of establishing a Jewish state consistently, without exception, took precedence over seeking um, uh, to assist and rescue uh, Jews living under uh, the Nazis boot, and we see it today where Israel quite freely embraces um, neo-Nazis as its best friends um, uh, in Europe and basically um, uh, gives them a, a kosher certificate in terms of their anti-Semitism and then denounces 
progressives as anti-Semites simply because they oppose Israeli policies. And 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 with this, you know, belittling the Holocaust, um, uh, making it subordinate to um, promoting Israel's agenda, there's really nothing new here for those who look into the history. On that note, Moen, we'll, we'll finish today's review. That was my guest, Moen Robani. And thank you for tuning in. See you next week for another episode of Memoirs Review with me, Nassim Ahmed and Moen Robani. Bye-bye.